Hello and welcome to Music Works, a podcast by Polyphony Arts. We're talking about the future of the classical music industry with some great guests. Thank you for joining us. Hello and welcome to Music Works, a podcast by Polyphony Arts. Today I'm talking to Fraser Gordon. Hello, Fraser. Hi, Katie. Hi, thank you so much for joining us. Would you like to tell us a bit about what you do? Um, Yeah, so uh, my name is Fraser Gordon and I am the contrabassoonist with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. Um, um, I do a lot of education work with the orchestra and with other musical groups. Um, I'm the bassoonist for the new London Chamber Ensemble, which is a wind quintet. Um, And I do a lot of tutoring and examining. I teach at the Royal Academy of Music um, and make a lot of reads. Um, So if you're watching, uh, you can see a lot of I'm sort of sitting at my read desk. If If you're not watching and you're listening, there's an awful lot of paraphernalia to do with contrabassoons and bassoons that looks a bit complicated sitting over one of my shoulders but you don't have to worry about that too much (laughs) (laughs) thank you i think that covid has um shaken things up a bit and shown the holes that i think that many of us knew were there but they've been really Mm. kind of brought to the forefront so I'm, i'm trying to have conversations with people about how how that is for them and what they think about that i don't know does that sort of ring any bells in terms of things you uh, well, yes, or? yes, of course. I mean, it, it does. Everybody's, we've all got an awful lot to say about what's going on right now and and whether we think that what's, uh, how it's going to change uh, will be for the better or for the worse in the long run. I mean, obviously, we're all hoping it's going to be for the better. Um, so, so yeah. If, yeah, if, like, this but may that's... be a bit of an immediate place to dive in, but if, like, you could think of one thing that could change for the better as a result of what we've all been through over the last few months what would it be one thing that could change for the better uh, in the general so in general classical music i think um well it has to be the big one it has to be funding it has to be that it has to be um uh i think more sort of solid um apart from just the basic more money which is kind of the obvious one but perhaps that that um uh, this the spread of it may needs to be more even so that the losses are um not weighted in any particular part of the classical music sector um uh, it, yeah it, that it's a funding is a massive massive issue um mm-hmm. i mean the other th- the other thing is it's whether that funding comes centrally or whether that the classical music sort of industry adapts um, in order to welcome more f- uh, philanthropy, maybe that maybe that's um, a way. Maybe that's a halfway house. Maybe yeah. that's something that we need to embrace more or encourage more. Because of course, no. Um, sorry, I'm giving a full answer here. Will I stop? <laughs> No, I'm, just, I'm immediately thinking of like a million tangents. So yeah, yeah, okay, good. I'm holding, I'm biting my tongue. Okay, <laughs> yeah. okay, good. No, that's great. That's fine. Yeah, no, I think. Um, sorry, did you have more you wanted to say about it? <laughs> no, no, I just, I just think that the philanthropy thing is. I mean, that's obviously like it, that's how the American art works, um, and it's not that we necessarily want to go fully down that road, but. Um, uh, it can take a long, long time to encourage people that have money to invest it um, where they trust um, it to be invested mm. um, in the arts. Um, and I think the arts could do with a lot more of that. There are some you know, institutions that, that have it up and running. But essentially, I think the balance between that and the reliance on the, the sort of central government funding... Um, maybe maybe the alteration of that maybe maybe that's the key to the survival of the arts or the or not even the survival of the arts the continuation maybe that's Mm. i you know off the top of my head it's definitely a lot about money isn't there in the arts i've I've been doing a lot of thinking about this obviously because i run music organizations that i seek funding for and then seek work for musicians as well Mm. and i I think there's like two there's two sides to it. One is that I think music in some ways isn't business like enough and doesn't look enough at what its audiences actually want. Mm. And I feel as though my experience of the funding world in the in terms of grant funding is that 
it is going more that way in the sense that funders, I believe, are looking at, or have been advised, are looking at funding applications and saying, well, if you don't have a sustainable business model in the first place, then we can't really give you any money because, you know, essentially you're not actually providing what your audience wants and that they're, they're not proving they want it by coming and buying tickets mm. or supporting you in other ways and so on. And I know that to do good grant funding applications, you have to have... Um, you know, proof in various forms of, of why what you're doing is wanted and why it's useful and so on. But on the other hand, um, I don't know, that then involves us knowing an awful lot about audiences. I think that audiences are being put under a lot of pressure at the moment because I'm aware of lots and lots of organisations that aren't able to produce their usual output, yep. asking people to help tied them over and there's a lot of goodwill in this industry and it's working for some people but I have really quite grave concerns about um you know for example music clubs music organizations repeatedly mm. asking their donors to pay for something when they're not providing a service or much of a service in return because yeah. ultimately I don't know I don't think that this is I don't think things are going to go back to exactly how they were before and I think that organizations have to be shifting um yeah. and you know so there's a huge amount of change there isn't there with like audiences preference audience preferences may change as well yes we're, and we're only just getting back into live music aren't we so yes i think that yeah. what the audience that is that's i mean so i used to sit on the board of the royal philharmonic orchestra of which am i member um and that the the the, the sort of funding um the the sort of funding model is is there is is uh, is only about ten percent um, grant um, over of the overall profit, which mm. really means that the orchestra has to listen to what the audiences want, and that is a, a very long term situation that kind of thing. You know, so you try a a new concert with new repertoire in it, um, and if it's a real success, you do the same next year. Yeah, but there's 12 months between that concert and the next concert. You can't roll out those concerts every month just in case mm. they're going to be a disaster. So that's really, really difficult um, because most uh, companies or institutions or um, or individuals in the arts will have to work so far ahead of themselves. It's di really difficult to sort of um, to have the guts to invest um, the time and the effort and the money in those kinds of concerts. And when you're absolutely not sure whether they're going to work out for you or not. Um, and the other thing about the what audiences want, I one of my big things in this is um, I think that sometimes the audiences don't know what they want. I yeah, think that's, I agree. that's important for everybody to, to have a little think about and how we might try and go around circumnavigating that issue. Um, and I I personally think it's about educating audiences. Now, there will be a certain amount of people that just want to come along and hear a symphony A by composer B, then that's absolutely fine because I'm sometimes like that you know, myself, um, you know, obviously I'm talking specifically about the orchestral world here because it's the mm. world that's close to me. Um, however, there, there is a way of um, sort of introducing audiences to, to music that they don't know that I think is, there needs to be slightly more well thought through than just programming it and, and seeing and you know and leaving it you know so whether that means somebody has to stand up in front of an orchestra and actually talk about it and talk about why this piece has been chosen and why you might not like it and if you don't like it that's okay um uh but why what you might draw from it is this 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 and you know music is all about the interpretation uh of you know how you're feeling when you're hearing it so anger might be something that it, you know the music might make you angry or um it's not it's not necessarily um going to make you sort of sit back and relax all the time and i'm not just talking about contemporary music i'm talking about any kind of music that that the people in the the concert hall have not heard before but i think sometimes um slamming a new piece in an audience's face with no background whatsoever is really, I mean, uh, I, I remember hearing some Ravel for the first time as, a, as a, a school kid and I hated it. I thought it was awful, really weird and I couldn't get to grips with it at all. So that, that mm. kind of thing is what I mean. It's, it's difficult unless you have a bit of background um, and perhaps 
Uh, I mean, I don't know. There are different ways of doing that. Some orchestras and um, you know, or education um, departments of orchestras and uh, musical institutions have have introduced getting to know, you know, getting inside a piece of music, whether it's, you know, a sort of lecture recital idea, which is, you know, enlarged onto a concert hall stage. You know, it, it it's, this is not a new idea that, you know, I'm not just plucking this out of the top of my head. It's, it's, it's been done before. Um, mm. And I, I think the problem with that is um, if you put that kind of thing on, it's a long term project in which you need to sort of, slowly build up the trust of the people that are buying the tickets and um it needs investment it needs somebody behind it to to support the orchestra because it it won't initially be a profit making um sort of uh idea it'll take a while before, i mean i don't know it'll take probably years before that's a profit making idea and um, so a lot of people won't want to invest in it um mm. i i don't think but but i think that's that's the whole I think that's the future I think that's you know we I do a lot of education um uh in my role in the orchestra as a sort of side to the performance um and I'm not I'm very sort of enthusiastic about educating uh, with children um whether it be in mainstream schools or special educational needs schools um but I think actually what I'm really talking about here is is educating adults you know, and some people don't want to be educated. We've sort of, I've said that before. Some people just want to come and hear their symphony number A that they, you know, they love, and that's the only symphony they'll they'll listen to. But um, I think educating adults, setting some people down, and uh, and telling them about the music and giving them and inviting them to sort of listen in an active way about a piece of music that they don't know, I think. Um, that that that's what I do. That I would do if I were in charge of all the orchestras in the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, I agree completely, and I think that I mean I think the phrase like educating people has a certain connotation to it about you know feeling like you need to sit in a classroom and learn things. But actually, there are lots of ways of educating people yeah. and lots of ways of sharing. You know, I often feel that, um, especially with the chamber music club that I run. The, my main aim with audience development is just to get people through the door once because mm. I believe that if people get through the door once, they then learn why it's great and why they want to keep coming back. Um, and if they don't, then that's fine. And, you you know, it's not everything is not for everyone. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> I believe there's a sort of disconnect between the impression that classical music gives as a sort of um genre almost or all the stuff that comes with it it's it's relatively niche um you know it has all the you know there are, um, you'd be so aware anyone that's listening would be so aware of the, the stigma attached to going to concerts and worrying about what you're going to wear and whether you're going to clap in the right places and so on and so forth yeah and even but, um, if i may interrupt you there that <laughs> even there there are a lot of people within our classical music um world that that you know i think all that chat is absolute nonsense and absolute totally. drivel. Yeah. Um, and so to, to someone like me, I mean, I've heard all of that before. And, you know, mm. the, and that's so it's not it's it, it's up to us within the classical musical world to be a little bit careful about how we um, approach that information when we're presented with it. And uh, mm. to make sure that we always remember that there will be somebody in that hall that has never heard the New World Symphony before and whose first time um, listening to that piece. And that happened to me once when I invited a student along to one of our concerts and he'd never heard um, Borges at Night. And he he was just really captured by m not just the music, but the, because he'd heard a recording of it, but he'd heard, he was captured by the atmosphere in the hall and the live, you know, the live music happening in front of him. So I think that our our approach from within the business, as you know, I'm only agreeing with you really here, um, needs to be very careful um, that we don't um, forget too quickly that all this information about um, coming to a concert for the first time and wearing to clap or whatever you know that it it, it does get tired we, it gets tired to, to us from our point of view to hearing all of that but we need to be careful that um we don't yeah as i said get sort of too angry about it you know because you know we 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 still need to keep mean, people feeling yeah. like they're in uh, welcome that's what yeah, I mean. I, I agree, but I, there's something nice about seeing things with fresh eyes as well, isn't there? Mm. And I, there's a slight um, 
It's not exactly what you were just talking about, but I'm always struck by the way um, I think there's an assumption in classical music that a lot of it is a lot of enjoyment of it is to do with knowledge. And while I don't disagree at all mm. about what you've said about um, adding some adding context and explanation and a kind of sense of of why this is great in a concert experience, particularly when you see performers or conductors talking about the music they're performing, I think there's something particularly engaging about that when they can mm. tell you exactly why this is so great for them yeah um, but my my husband is not um a particular classical music fan he does like it because i like it but he never was before we were together and if we go to a really really incredible concert together the fact that it was a really really incredible concert is not lost on him mm. he he may not be able to kind of specify exactly why, why in the same right. way that i can but he okay. the magic is exactly the same and he oh. can sit there and go that was, you know, awesome. an exceptional yeah. thing. And I don't think that we necessarily give audiences enough credit in terms of the fact that actually you don't have to have a ton of knowledge to feel that the thing that is felt. Yes, um, that's true, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's just my, my thoughts on that. <laughs> no, <laughs> you're absolutely you. right, yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, and I think, so what do you think then, so what's your experience of the way live music is coming back? Um, slowly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, sorry, that's an obvious. Uh, I mean, well, uh, although maybe that's not quite true. I mean, what I'm seeing right now is um, I see some um, people, and I mean individuals and companies, um, being quite busy, and that's really good. Um, and so it's def you know, like live music is the the. The, it's it's really difficult because I think like you know I, I've been in inside rehearsal venues and I've been I've already been playing with others um you know safely and and all of that and um and I've I've performed uh in Vertikova's concert um which was recorded um for an audience to be streamed at a later date and that felt fine borderline amazing for me you know to have my first sort of experience after all that time um and but to have the, the lack obviously you know it's it's the cliche thing to say obviously the lack of the live audience is the major weird factor um but there's still there was still something good in getting dressed up in concert gear and there so there was a little bit of sense of performance i would say about 25 percent sense of performance that so that evening um and some orchestras are continuing that way, and that's that's fantastic. And and some are not because you know, like mine are not are not because the profit model is mm. there's there's sort of no money to be made, and it's not necessarily about you know making tons and tons of money. Like it's it's we about have to make some money though, don't spending we? <laughs> all the money that that yeah. we don't have, and that that you know that's essentially what no everybody can afford to stream concerts online for free. That's that's really difficult for most arts organisations when they're seeing other people doing it for free. So, mm. um, so live music sort of going ahead. I mean, it's it's good. I'm seeing it happen. You know, I was playing at a trio outside Wembley Stadium the other day, and you know, with people walking past and are appreciating it, and that, you know, that's nice. So, it, but I mean, uh, it's just small pockets of things. I think, um, um, and this this business is is a really large, large patchwork of mm. amazing different things going on all at the one time. And when I first moved to London, I had, I was overwhelmed by what to go and see on any given night because, you know, I was thinking I'd never had all of this music at my fingertips before. I need to go and see it all. And, you know, first of all, it was quite expensive. And second of all, I didn't have enough time and I couldn't keep you know track of what was going on from day to night. And obviously that now has all gone. Um, so that, yeah, that's that's weird. It, it'll be interesting to see how f how fast it, um, it returns or not and what, what sort of form it returns in. Because um, uh, I'm not sure is the honest mm. statement on that. Absolutely. I mean, it's clear thinking about an orchestra like the RPO that the amount of money it costs to get all of those people in a space together performing needs a lot of people in a space together listening on that model yeah. to uh, to fund it. And yeah. um, and neither of those things is easy 
all possible at all. No, um, at the yeah. moment, you know, no, absolutely, some all is possible, but not not all the people. <laughs> yes, absolutely, and all the back, all the background planning that goes into that, and. Um, well, that's it. You can't just with fling staff it together, that can you? are not, you know, not working because they're on furlough, and you can't ask mm. them to prepare for concerts because we can't afford to pay them right now, um, etc. So yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's definitely tricky. Um, more than tricky. That more than tricky. Flippant. Yes. Uh, no, it's not well, flippant. It's uh, it's very tricky. Yeah. So tell me what it's been like teaching during lockdown. Well. Um, I've done a bit of teaching during lockdown, um, a couple of different things um, have been really interesting for me. First of all, as the contrabassoon teacher at the Royal Academy of Music, it's very difficult because, I mean, so the contrabassoon is quite an expensive instrument, so it's not really expected that what well, students will own their own instruments unless they're, you know, um, really excelling and uh, are definitely going to pursue that. But even then, mm. it's, it's it's a massive financial um block yeah, it's definitely one of the big ones isn't it yeah. yeah so so that means that actually I, I it wasn't really possible for me to teach most of my REM students at, over zoom or, or whatever medium you you know they prefer um because they don't have their own instruments mm. so um a couple of them have um and there was I found a nice way to um to do that uh, but we didn't want to use up the live contact time too much um, hoping that um, that we could sort of bank the time, um, and the academy had to academy have to. I'm sure most institutions that work on that sort of with budgets, you know, they have to clear up the budget, and so I had to be paid for the teaching that I didn't do, um, because it wasn't possible. Um, but all that time will be owed. So I essentially sort of have written to all my students <clears throat> saying. You know, essentially, like this is an IOU mm. lesson of two and a half hours or whatever, because it's not principal study; it's related study. Um, and the academy were very much focusing on those um, lessons and related study in their who were in their final years to try and get them going. You know, towards mm. the final recitals. So, um, but we had contact with the students every week, which was really good. And that, I mean, I didn't claim for any of that because I think. I think that that contact time is really important, and we we at the academy had invited various guest bassoonists from all corners of the globe to come and speak to the students, you know, on a, on a very casual basis. So it wasn't like an on a sort of formal online masterclass or anything. Um, but I was also asked to do um, some mm-hmm. online uh, classes. Is not quite the right word. Workshops is a better word. Um, for the National Children's Orchestra. Um, so this year was good to be the first year that I was going to be a tutor for the National Children's Orchestra. So, of course, when, um, as ever, at the beginning of lockdown, we itched towards uh, Easter, of course, which obviously was cancelled however many weeks before. Um, you know, I was increasingly nervous that I wouldn't get to tutor um all those young bassoonists who are about to experience their very first Sorcerer's Apprentice, which is, I think is one of the most amazing pieces to play on the bassoon That's because you were all in it together and yeah. it's such a famous tune and everybody knows the film and, you know, it's oh. so, it was, it was the such a... rite of passage. Oh, there, yeah, Sorcerer's definitely, yeah. And, <laughs> yeah, and so I think that when, when I was approached some weeks or months later, I don't know, um, by the NCO to then ask if I would be interested in, you know, tutoring on their online summer course. I sort of jumped to the chance, you know, mostly because I thought, well, we can still do something with the Sorcerer's Apprentice. I don't know. I haven't worked that out yet. But, you know, I was sort of desperate to try and um, to try and think of something. So, you know, the, they were really good. And what was absolutely, it was quite inspiring for me. I, I had to prepare, you know, I had to re- prepare a rehearsal videos, if you like, um, of me as if I were tutoring in a sectional. But of course, it's me with this background and there's no bassoon students in front of me, kind of taking through them, taking them through this piece and what they might find difficult. But of course, there's nobody to respond to. So I don't know necessarily what they're going to find difficult. So, I, you know, I'd sort of take them through everything and, and try and not be too militant about it. Try and because, you know, they're kind of there to have fun, mostly. You know, of course, it's an educational thing, but like kids, the, what we do, what we do is, you know, at all levels, at all ends of this um, 
business, whether you're a kid or whether you're, you know, in a professional log store or string quartet or whatever, it's a very social um, sector. Um, and the aspect of it is really important for children um, and, and as well as students, as well as adults. And that's obviously what we've all been missing during lockdown, as well as, you know, physically playing our instruments um, is is the interaction with, with each other. And that's really important. Um, and it's really important for individuals motivation so what nco also did was that we had so they had those rehearsal videos which i prepared on my own before the course sort of opened if you like um and they were all online for the children to use or watch or, you know and stop and practice those bits or play along with me or whatever they wanted to do with them and and then record their piece that was they that was sort of already done but we had live sessions which were just sort of social interaction like and i mean i sort of called it bassoon chats because it was i actually in in, in the end i had 20 bassoonists from all over the uk oh. aged somewhere between 10 and 13 which was and do you know it was the largest amount uh the largest number of um instruments for in the wind and brass like flutes weren't as many as that it was ama yeah, really amazing really. so they had to split them up into three groups for me and they were all so much fun and i really sort of still slightly broken hearted that they haven't actually met each other in person but children are so adaptable and i think it was it was fine for them and I, we chatted about what they love about the bassoon and what annoys them a bit and actually it was hopefully nice for them to hear that the other kids you know the other side of wales think that it's annoying that the bassoon's really heavy to carry to school as well so they're not on the they're not, you know, alone because you actually you might be in the only person in school that is alone, you know, I was going to say in any individual area having any more than zero bassoons is highly desirable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not so, always, well, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's amazing for me to have 20, of them. I know, that's you know, just like, yeah. Uh, and then we had, so we had that, and we, you know, we did some stuff and they asked me some, you know, I played them some things and, uh, you know, and we talked about some weird stuff techniques that they might hear about but don't really know it's all about planting the seeds um you know and uh, another freelance bassoonist connie tanner was uh she was taking the the juniors of the nco and we, we had sort of planned these these classes together and i think we thought planting the seeds of those advanced techniques was a really important aspect of our little sort of of our chats for them um and i just yeah, I, I'm really looking forward to the day that we get into that hall and play um, Sorcerer's Apprentice. Sorry, we, I was almost said Somebody Fantastic. It's because we did a bit of Somebody Fantastic as well. We were talking about that. You know, practice this at home. Let's try it. Play it along with me. And, you know, they were all on Zoom and they all muted themselves. And they were playing along with me playing it. And, you know, so it, it, like on the screen, of course, you can't hear 20 bassoons all playing together. Mm -hmm. um, but... Um, Although what we did was I, I unmuted them all and the, mostly the chat worked quite easily. So it, anyway, that's sort of getting into technical details, which is not that necessary. But um, but so I, so I found myself doing that over over summer and uh, the build up to that was really exciting and really good. And, and I realised that that is actually something that I miss. I, I really enjoy teaching um, mm. the interaction of it as well. You know, as, as I've said, it's not just the music making the teaching, I, I enjoy that. Um, the challenge, the brain challenge for me as, as the teacher or the professor or, or wherever I'm teaching, it's, it's really important. You know, somebody's not quite understanding how to do it from what I've said. Well, I have to think of a better way to say it or some circumnavigate the problem for this person in a different way because it might be something that I find quite easy or I'm more natural about. So I haven't thought about it hard enough um, so I quite like the aspect of that, that aspect of teaching rather. Yeah, and that's it. that brings me to something I, I made a quick note there when you were talking before, because something that I, I've heard, heard of a few, not tons, but a few really interesting ways of continuing study online where right. kind of online actual performance isn't particularly ideal or certainly not for like long periods of time. And mm. like, for example, a singer that I know organised an Italian workshop and it wasn't, they didn't do anything at all. They just worked on text in a way mm. that you wouldn't usually do but actually yeah. that's an incredibly good use of, of zoom and i was wondering is this is this period teaching us because um i'm mean, gonna ask a long and roundabout question but i'm wondering if this is teaching us things about how we can learn without necessarily practicing our instruments all the time so i was just curious as to whether this is teaching us things about 
what parts of teaching are to do with playing instruments and what parts are to do with talking and reading and do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. And I think mm-hmm. that it's really important that the students, and I hope that, well, I would like to say I hope that all of my students or all of this, all of the students, every, music students everywhere have, have realised that um, when you turn up to a lesson, your lesson shouldn't be a practice session, a supervised practice session, mm. you know, which um, definitely some of my students are guilty of. Um, and and I, I, going back to what I said before, helping them, you know, teach themselves, you know, I, I'm happy to sit there and 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 sort of practice with them and, and try and show them ingenious ways to practice and things and after the 10 minutes of doing that it should be better um but actually that definitely should be time that that to me is not contact time not good use of contact time is a better way to put it and i i would imagine that then the some of the other students that i've seen over the last few years um often come in and they're 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 after advice on this situation or that situation that that is you know very valuable use of time I, th- I think actually um and it's not it's not necessarily always chargeable you know i you know i'm happy to f- to receive a, a short phone call and if if there's something i need to answer um uh quickly then but i but yeah i think there's there's definitely there are there are better uses for time than than simply sort of practice sessions from a student's yeah. point of view or from a teacher's point of view from both um and utilizing the lesson time i think i like to think that most people after this will use it wisely i certainly said to my pupils or students rather at the academy they've um please don't use your iou lesson time you know sort of willy-nilly if you've got something you're preparing for an audition or something like that that's when I think you'll get the most out of our time you know when I'm giving you advice on "Mm, it needs to be a bit faster or you know no that tempo's good or that kind of thing you're preparing at at that level anyway I think um so yeah I I definitely do think um it will uh it will uh it will change the way that people approach to lessons i would well certainly for the brighter students mm. I, th- I hope i really hope that that's the case because in certainly in england they're paying an awful lot of money to study at a higher institution you know at school it that's might be it. a different scenario um but a higher higher educate in higher education it's an awful lot of money um so actually perhaps they're seeing there's um i said ser- i certainly haven't seen um over uh, use of my time um, on Zoom um, or anything mm. like that. It's it's always been very very efficient when a student has wanted to have a lesson, which is which is good. I think they and they've always yeah. been very prepared. Um, so good. yeah, it is very good. It's, it's, it's often Zoom meetings and more kind of work world can be the kind of thing that you don't prepare for. Don't really, yeah, really. no. <laughs> don't yeah, yeah. Travel anywhere. You just like take all of that coefficient for uh, I had one the other day where my and this was to be fair not my fault but the, because we're having some work done in our house and the builder right, told yeah. me with two minutes to go there you had to turn the power off and I, was, <laughs> I was like I logged onto the meeting and said oh, oh, no. second, I just have to tell him not to <laughs> yes <laughs> <Just> like, <laughs> that's good that's good yeah <laughs> so on this on, whilst we're still on the subject of education one of the things that um I, I do with the orchestra is a lot of work in the community i can't remember if i've said that already or not um on our, on our session so far um and that's something that we've the orchestra have managed to do already um is, is get a couple oh, of good. community sessions going on online so and as you know because you're up in hull or near hull um that i I'm involved in the Strokestra project, uh, which is based in Hull, uh, in mm. partnership between the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra and um, the, I think, Humberside NHS, the Clinical Stroke Service. Um, and we, in their very early sort of stages of lockdown, we had prepared a bit like the NCO practice sort of videos, like we'd prepared sort of material for them, a bit like a workshop that we would perhaps do. Of course, it part of what makes that structure project special is the chat at the beginning as well as the music making you know it's this personal interaction with people that makes people feel that we're not these horrible or not horrible that's not right but we're not these sort of random outsiders that they don't have 
any um, sort of relationship with that, you know, so the chat is really important. So that mm. that's the difficult bit that that's not there, but we did prepare videos um, for them. We haven't done a live session with them um, because that the, sort of the care home situation, for example, that we were working in is, is more difficult. But we have um, done children's sessions sort of on Zoom where we have had four musicians in a room in London, uh, you know, and we've sort of been reading stories and asking children that are coming from different parts of London um, to, to tell us what to play, what animals to be in, in the story and, and, you know, and joining oh, in with great. the story and that sort of thing. <laughs> so, and I think that essentially that, so yeah, it is really great. And it's what, this it's why I'm in this business. It's, it's I mean, I'm in this business. I mean, I love playing the bassoon. Um, but I love sharing music with others. That that's what this business is, means to me. You know, this what we do is very, very, very special, and no one can take Absolutely. that away. Um, but what when you share that with others, then that's that's the lockdown problem. Mm. You know, and sort of circ- circumnavigating the, um, the the issue of how do we get this musical message out to others? Because when you're in a room with somebody making music, and it can be a hundred people on stage play the Rite of Spring, or or two people playing um, bought up violin duets, it's that atmosphere is is amazing, and being part of it, um, uh, and in a community setting, making people realise that they can be part of it too is really really special i think that's and that's where you sort of really hit hit into people's sort of the inner parts of their soul i think and they realize that you know it doesn't matter if you don't like classical music you can say whatever music you like it doesn't really matter but it's it's music making and it there's some intrinsic part of all of us um is is really locked into that music making I think and uh, so bringing our music to people is that's it that's that's what's missing right now a bit but hopefully we'll get it back oh yeah so I have a um a general concern which has been around for a long time way before covid was was ever thought of or yeah. heard of which is that um, audiences and musicians of the future aren't getting the musical experience that they need as children to um, to really kind of become part of a of a thriving classical music community in the future. I think this is this isn't this is possibly something that's at least one or two generations away from like in the past from the children that we have now because I think yeah you can see it in audiences for you know things like regional music clubs and things like that they have a tendency to be older they have a tendency to be um, middle class and so on and so forth and it, and it does in my opinion entirely correlate with the educational opportunities you know because there's you know, as a child of a musical family, I had a ton of expo- exposure to music and yeah. lo and behold, I work in music, you know, and I, I, yeah. I feel that um, it can be quite patchy. So I think that the work that the orchestras do in this is absolutely brilliant and essential. And the fact that the, the kind of way it works means that there's a lot of focus on trying to get it into communities where it might not otherwise be heard. Um, is really important as well. I just sort of wanted to yeah. mention that and see what your no. view is on, on that. I think that's really important. And I think that one of the things that the orchestras do um, when they visit is is hopefully inspire and, uh, and motivate um, mm. kids to perhaps get involved in music or kids who are involved in music already to, you know, sort of really practice and work towards something that they want or they see might be possible like being in an orchestra or or whatever that's not the that's not necessarily the the pinnacle goal but um to try and inspire people but i think that the orchestra's visits and community work as much as i know that every time we connect with um with a group, a community group, whether that be you know stro- the stroke patients in Hull or, or pr- uh, prisoners in Wandsworth Prison or something like that, uh, we try and connect with people and leave them something. So rather than it be just a sort of uh, wham bam visit, like I play the bassoon, this is how amazing it is. By, um, we try and leave something, um, which is, which is great. 
Um, but I also think that what orchestras do in those situations is not necessarily um, a good enough, um, well, it's definitely not a good enough, uh, what's the right word, um, replacement for grassroots uh, musical education. Um, oh, sure. We, yeah. we can't do that because it needs regular, that's, that's a regular not, that's thing. That's not what it's for. These, it's these, not, that's what, not what, it's what for. these projects are for. Yeah, exactly. I agree completely. Yeah, so, and I think yeah. we, we can help those and we what we what orchestras um, and musical groups must do is find a way to work alongside um, community music groups um, and music teachers in schools um, and and communicate with them effectively and ask them what they want us to do you know so we're not just coming in stomping all over everything and just going look how good we are by um, mm-hmm. and sometimes you know you could get music teachers that are sort of tearing their hair out going well you know it's all very well for them you know they just swan into this school you know and do a, a sort of half an hour workshop work with the kids and everybody wants to suddenly play the contrabassoon that's not how necessarily <laughs> life will be you know in a state school wherever wherever in the country um yeah, you, you know i go came to the contrabassoon cupboard and get one out to have a try can you yeah yeah not quite yeah. um and but i mean it is it's a it's a part of the whole problem um or the sort of classical music business, which I'm very passionate about. I didn't come from a musical family at all. Um, and I had free bassoon lessons at school. Um, and I went to almost all the after school wind bands and orchestras, you know, at school level and at regional level. Um, and it got to a point where the, there was then a sort of private youth orchestra, Edinburgh Youth Orchestra. Um, and I, I paid for those summer courses from my own pocket just mine you know my parents didn't pay for them um and ended up going to music college um and I you know of course I was supported by my parents but like the financial support wasn't like huge because they couldn't afford it um so it and and now I'm in a music business surrounded by people who mostly went to um specialist music school um um and who are mostly from middle class families, um, and yeah, that that's it's an argument that I sort of need to sit down and think a bit more about actually because I I'm not very eloquent at talking about it, perhaps because I've spent so many years in these environments, um, slightly backing off uh, chats about it because because of a working class background. Um, and wondering, you know, where I fit into all of this, and um, mm. perhaps it's I've tried to fit into it after a number of years, and perhaps, you know, to to everybody when I visit my area of uh, of uh, Scotland, that everybody thinks, oh, he's a, a middle class idiot now, or whatever <laughs> they think about how I speak, because it's definitely not not how I used to speak. Um, because I've changed that in order to try and fit in, and I think that not. You, you don't have to fit in, you don't have to change, but it's certainly an easier way to go about it in this business. And so I think a bit like when I was saying about we need to remember that it's some always somebody's first time listening to Vorjak 9 or whatever popular music piece that musicians perhaps don't want to play again because we've played it a million times. We've, um, we've yeah, we've got to always have our doors open um, in this business um, to audiences as well as new new people, n- new members of the community, you know, at professional level, uh, mm-hmm. students and, 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 and not have any preconceived ideas and try not let our preconceived ideas sort of affect um, who we're coming into contact with. And one other thing I'd like to say sort of before I sign off on that one is that Oh, if you're sitting listening to this thinking, I'm definitely, I'm very open, I'm very um, inclusive, then actually I think you're probably not. I think if (laughs) people that are, well, somebody once said to me when I was really, really, really worried about being in tune or not uh, not in tune, um, people once said to me, sometimes people that are the most worried about being in tune are absolutely fine. And if you're not worried about being in tune, then you need to worry. So I think sometimes we all need to make sure that we're never being complacent about being um, inclusive um, uh, in any 
part, you know, and I mean members of the orchestra, new members of the orchestra or guests coming into the orchestra as well as members of the audience or people who walk past, you know, and a, a trio play, playing outside Wembley and just kind of go, well, what's that? And, you know, they just stick, stick around for five minutes because they're kind of interested in what that weird long wooden instrument might be. And, you know, we just kind of try our best at all levels to be as inclusive as we can. Um, and if you're thinking that you're definitely, definitely the most inclusive person, I'm pretty sure you're probably not. Yeah, I feel there's some work to be done in the music industry in general to do with inclusivity on almost every level. But even without focusing on the really big issues like race and disability, even just within relatively average people's lives, the amount of money they make, the the ability to do things like raise a family or have caring mm. responsibilities or have anything else really going on in your life, as well as yeah. a freelance music career is incredibly difficult and not very sympathetically received. Yeah. Um, the ability to navigate it whilst not having quite a lot of disposable income to do things like go on courses and do ne- do things that are good just for networking that don't yeah. have like a and sort of <clears throat> quantifiable outcome. Yeah, absolutely. Though, though that that creates enormous inequality in um, in the music industry, as as you know, as you've described. Um, yeah. I think that you know there are people that kind of make it through those barriers into being professional musicians despite those things. Yeah. And then obviously you find them you find yourselves in a situation where you may be surrounded by people who aren't like that. And then you think, you know, for each of those people who is there from a, you know, from a wealthy background, who's been able to, to afford all of the, you know, the cost of training as a musician is, is enormous. It's yeah, absolutely it's enormous. enormous. And the cost um, of like building up all of all of the equipment that I need behind me, for well, example. Well, look at that. I mean, to, if you to, cost up your background. To do, to do, <laughs> a set, kind of, to do my job, you know. And I, yeah. uh, yes, some of it's tax deductible and some of it I've borrowed and, and been given I've, and some of it I've bought and some of it I've like been gifted and uh, all that, you know. I, but I mean, it's now a, a useful skill that I have and that I put to, to sort of good use and makes me a very sort of dr- sort of slow drip of income. Um, but I think in all of that, essentially, there are people in our business that, and there are not very many of them, there are more now that are challenging the ways that the classical music business runs. Um, and I put my my hand up and say that I, I'm not very good at doing that. I'm 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 a very status quo person. I'm very uh, afraid of change. I think I don't like new things necessarily, you know. But I think I think that we all need to make sure that even if we are like like me, rather than being a person who's you know a, a pioneer in in the change of the business, that we all remain open to listening to the people that are trying to bring about change. Um, and this is a this business. I mean, even one orchestra is like. A, a ta- an oil tanker, you know, moving through a great ocean. Um, you know, this is one of my favorite analogies about orchestras. Um, and <laughs> you, you really like if you, if somebody, a new captain of the ship was sort of landed by helicopter in the middle of a long journey, you know, and this, this sort of happened when, when we had a new um, managing director a few years ago, if that person were to come on on board and, and immediately like go, no, this is the direction of the ship and turn the wheel like that way. And then, you know, I mean, that, that ship would never, ever, it would sink immediately. Everyone would be it, flying everywhere. Yeah, yeah, it would be a disaster. <laughs> yeah. and, and so the whole point of what I'm trying to say is that this is a very slow to adjust business. And, and uh, so it's difficult to bring about change. And what I would say to the people that are, sort of trying to bring about change is to, to not give up with us that are the slower people. Like, you know, I, me, I'm one. Um, and, but this whole fleet of ships that are moving from one end of the ocean to the other that like have to be steered very, very slowly. And the adjustment is so slow. But as long as that person, you know, when we reach the other, the new part of the land, is waving that red flag, is still waving the red flag when we get there, then we won't lose the track of where we're going, essentially. Mm. And I think that's, that's 
really important. I think we all need to remember where we're going, not be sort of too disillusioned by the path, even though it might be scary or, or whatever it might be. You know, you could apply this to kind of any walk of life, I suppose. But I think mm. um, the classical music business is, is, is a very good example at this precise moment in time, because there is a new path that can be taken through all of this. And I mean, I'm scared to do something different with my life, really, you know, but I'm going to probably going to have to um, in order to make a different income. That, that That's a separate sort of personal issue. But, um, and I, I, yeah, so I, I've said, I've made that point, I think, haven't I? <laughs> Definitely. It's a great point. I do love the analogy. I think I'm going to think of that one often. Yes. <laughs> I've often told I bring up too many of those analogies. So I stupid, love it. Stupid and I was analogies just imagining, about ships. Imagining what would happen without. I feel like this might end up a bit cheesy as a, That's as, okay. a as a continuation of your analogy. But I'm just okay. imagining what would happen if everyone on those ships like leaned in rather than leaning the other way. Yeah. You know, lead into the the, the path of change. It could you know it could be really incredible. And I think a lot of people yeah. do. Um. But yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree, and I um. I don't know. And and also, I mean, but big change comes from adversity. You know, mm. historically, this is this is a fact. And I mean, you That's know, true. you talk about personal career changes. I mean, my personal career change when I happened when I had my son and realized what I was doing at the time didn't work anymore. And mm. that was on a personal level. And now this is happen- what's happening at the moment is happening on a, a global level. Yeah. So, you know. If ever there was a catalyst to kind of make the boat do that, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, maybe that. Maybe this is it, and it mm. just takes, it takes faith, um, I think, and and foresight, to make mm. sure, and and for everybody that's sort of, that is, the leaders of the of that faith and foresight to um to not. Well, the, the, I mean, those people need support from all of us. Yeah. Um, they really do. Um, but the, those leaders, uh, they need support in, um, in staying sort of steadfast, you know, and all to use all those sort of words you learned in study school and didn't really understand them, sort of thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, it it it's, it does it does need that, and it would be really interesting to see what happens. You know, I I I don't, as I said before, I think I've I'm not a great person for a change so I don't naturally come up with exciting ideas for things to do ways to take things forward um but I'll, I'll happily get behind people that that do have the good ideas because I think now is the time to do that I think it's important for us to all have open ears not be blinkered um in in thinking we'll get back to this exactly as it was before i mean i still want to play the big symphonies in the big cutter halls around the world and i think people will of, still of want that everyone still wants that to happen but um, yeah but the makeup yeah. of of it yeah the makeup of individual orchestras or, or companies um where the profit comes from and a lot of orchestras were already starting to di- di- diversify uh their sort of their incomes before this um mm. and individuals were too you know um so I was. I wanted to ask you before, actually, and I forgot. Yeah. Um, this might seem a bit minor in the context of what we've just been talking <laughs> about. But do you um, do you think, in your experience of of working in professional orchestras and working in the education department, um, in the education work that they do, are the people who play in the orchestras getting? Would you feel like they were they're getting more into doing that than they were before, or do you think people there have always been people in orchestras that are really keen to do really good education work like you are? Um, or like, is it a popular thing? Because I, I have always, I feel as if there's an impression in the industry that this is something that, that like the top flight professional musicians aren't keen on doing. But my personal experience is not that. My personal experience is that, that there are some absolutely incredible musicians that are really keen, like yourself, that are really keen on doing this kind of thing. So I'm just curious what your experience is. Um, it, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's, I think it's quite a hot topic, actually. It's a hot topic that's not very... Uh, it's it's a hidden hot hidden topic in within an <laughs> orchestra kind of for example yeah. <laughs> i think there are um yeah there are i mean so sort of before covid you know my orchestra is extremely busy has an extremely busy schedule so there are some people that uh, don't just don't have the time to mm. to do it and some people that would not rather take off a couple of concerts to do education mostly I think it's not generally because they think it's rubbish. 
uh, or they think it's no. uh, not not of any value. I think it's mostly um, actually because if they just think it's not their thing or they're not very comfortable in that environment, um, you know, because there's def- a definite stigma about um, within certainly orchestral musicians of, you know, oh, I don't, uh, that's not me. I don't have the skills to do that. Um, uh, I, I feel very comfortable in an education t- sort of setting um, and sort of launched myself straight into it because as being the contrapassoon player I was less busy than everybody else in the orchestra so I was more available to 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 do those projects but I also loved it so whenever there was a project that clashed with something I would invariably not appear on stage and be doing this community project elsewhere Mm. um so yeah I it, it it's it's difficult I think it's not for everybody but my certainly Orchestras, I mean, not my orchestra offer uh, training sessions, and actually, some of they've offered some training sessions uh, to some uh, small numbers of people whilst we've been um, in this time, um, in in this time in inverted commas, um, <laughs> whilst we've been you know off not doing anything. The the, the education mm-hmm. department have taken this opportunity whilst they've got their musicians to sort of invite people to come in and do training to sit down and talk about what will happen in a workshop what to expect what you don't what not to expect what will be expected of you you know like some people are really feared of like um improvisation and Mm. that kind of thing are being asked to do sort of being asked to play on the spot and that's you know a lot of people that's vastly out of their comfort zone and I you know I I was invited along to a couple of those sessions in order to sort of talk to my colleagues about the work that we do not just what I do and and how what is not what is acceptable what is expected and what to expect and and also about the fact that like when I started, I made it known to the, our head of education that I have um, a significant issue with uh, working with adults in that context. And she made a significant effort, put a significant effort into m- put me only on adult projects in order to, you know, to sort of aid my sort of professional development, if you like. Mm. Um, and it really worked. And that's that's why I'm involved in the stroke project in Hull. Um, because I essentially had a sort of issue with a patron, that's a side issue, but a sort of issue with the line between teaching and or educating and, and sort of patronising people. And I think I'm more aware of where that line is with children and younger people and mm, less aware where there is uh, with, with adults. So, I mean, that's an education, a, a, another subject. Um, mm. But I think in the context of that work, there is there is an increasing need for it and there is an increasing... Um, awareness within the music within the musicians um, I think of the need for that to connect with audiences in different ways you know and sometimes some projects some of the best projects we've we've done are a small number of people working with kids let's say in the run-up to a concert and the and the kids are involved in the running of the concert sort of however many months down the line this was a project done a partnership between the RPO and Orchestras Live, which is one of the best projects I think I've ever been involved with. And the kids essentially design the concerts. They they choose the music. And, you know, aside from actually conducting the orchestra, they're pretty much doing everything else. You know, they take on all the background roles of the orchestra manager and they're helping put music out. They're helping the librarian. They're operating cameras and selling tickets at the front and et cetera, et cetera. You know, they get a full spectrum. So I think it was Orchestra's Live's amazing. idea. It is amazing. It was amazing. We did one on Hull, in fact. Yeah, we did them in... Yeah, I, it was Orchestra's Live, sort of the, the idea of not just giving them an insight into, you know, how a professional orchestra works, but all the other jobs that go around, you know, like in the arts, because, you know, it's not everybody that is inspired by a flute player that comes to school can be that flute player. So, yeah. but you can be inspired, but and actually a lot of them were like, actually, I really like the, the role of the orchestra manager where you get to yeah. boss all the musicians around and all that sort of thing. So, so, and so, the, but the point of telling you about that was that, so that was a very sort of specific bunch of, musicians are my co- me and my colleagues who are used to working these projects and, and enjoy it and do a lot of it and who are perhaps more free um and it every time we sort of revisited the kids there were more and more until eventually they were working with a full orchestra and of course they don't get to meet 
the entire orchestra individually, but the whole orchestra is involved in this project, and they all, ha- all my colleagues, have to buy into it. And I, you know, from the minute they sit down, that some of the grumpier members of the orchestra, I could see them thinking, "Oh, this is not what is this." But actually, five minutes in, the kids are running the show, and and the the show is being put on for kids, so it's their their peers. Their this is whole all being set up for, and. I actually I look quick look around the orchestra in the middle of the concert. Almost every musician has bought into that. Really, mm. they all all did, and they all see the value of it. Like, and will will tell you about enthusiastically as as enthusiastically as I have ab- about those projects. You know, we did them all over. We've done them with Carlisle, Doncaster, Sunderland, Hull, Lowestoft, sort of. Um, uh, yeah, quieter cultural parts of the cu- the country, one might say, um, and and yeah, so I think that the orchestra, it's it was really heartening for me to see my colleagues all buy into that fully, and so I think they all appreciate, you know, this this other arm, the orchestra, and it's an arm that increasingly is more important that if you cut it off, the orchestra would struggle to survive oh, it's more of a leg now i suppose i'm quite intimidated by kids especially groups of kids right because they're you know they're terrifying aren't they and uh <laughs> no i don't adults. see i don't think so i think <laughs> groups of adults could be terrifying but i think essentially what we're talking about here we're it's we're talking about communication and yeah. uh, perhaps it's just my slight like nervous or shyness about communicating fully with adults where i think like children are like sponges and you know it, it's no skin off their nose if you tell them something they've already heard before it doesn't matter um or if you tell them something like planting the seeds of tech about the technique uh to the nco bassoons that the planting the seeds of very 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 advanced technique mm. most some of them will retain that some of them will do something about it and some of them will forget it instantly and that's mm. all fine but with adults like you've some of them are sponges some of them are sponges that are full some of them are sponges that do not want to take on any water like absolutely do not give me any water some of them will reject you because you've told yeah. them something that you, they know or, or yeah so I think that that the, all the hang ups um, that adults have, uh, I don't know. I no, if yeah, you've got a classroom or, or you know a group of totally receptive adults, then fine. Yeah. I think one of the things I've uh, has really helped me is is has been observing um, workshop leaders working with groups of adults, you know, and and how they deal with it. I mean, it's a stup- It's not a stupid thing to say. It's it is a slightly obvious thing to say, but you know, we learn from all, watching other people, yeah. um, and. You know, and there's just this sort of sheer explanation and there's no sort of apology for dumbing down some information for adults because not everybody will have heard it the first time they've said it or, you know, I'm just going to tell you this again. It's absolutely fine. Blah, blah, blah. You know, and that that sort of has made me very much more comfortable um, in working with adults, um, Mm. which is good. Um, I still feel more natural in, in an environment with children. Or yeah. students, perhaps, but um, I don't know. That's, that's Maybe that's just uh, because I'm a, a big kid myself. <laughs> I, I relate to that more. I'm, I don't know. <laughs> I think I've retained from childhood a fear of saying something and everyone just looking at me like, what? <laughs> yeah. Well, I definitely have that. And, and the kids are more likely to do that than yeah, adults yeah. with me, maybe. Oh, really? Oh, I don't know. I definitely will be right. Yeah, well, maybe it's well. just how I feel more inhibited with the adults. I... Some funny... <laughs> Yeah. It's interesting. Well, you know, we need people who like different things, don't we? Otherwise, don't do true. anything. <laughs> yeah. It would be boring otherwise. It would indeed. Well, it's been lovely to talk about this. <laughs> yes, I totally agree. It's good. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, well, thank you so much for coming on today, Fraser. It was lovely to chat. You're very welcome. It's very nice to chat. Thank you. And thanks to everybody that's been listening. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening today. To find out what we're up to, do join our mailing list or follow us on social media. And if you'd like to support the podcast by buying me a coffee, you can do that on buymeacoffee.com. Thank you so much. See you next time.